how many people are surprised when they see Emma Booth equestrian horses? How many people are surprised that it wasn't a horse-related accident? As soon as I add in the element of the accident was involving a truck. One of the injured women gets pulled from the tangled wreckage. The 51-year-old female driver of this car wasn't so fortunate. Killed when this truck veered onto the wrong side of Melba Highway in Dixon's Creek, crushing her van and another car. It was a really bad accident and I was really lucky. My friend who was actually driving, we were both really lucky to come out alive. Dispel my moral dilemma around yeah. the mistreatment of horses for sport or entertainment. Right, so I would have to say that You often get the people going, oh, but, well, you just sit there and do nothing, especially in able-ready dressage. Like, oh, you don't do anything, the horse does all the work. And you're like, actually, thank you, that's a compliment, because the less it looks like you're doing, the better job you're doing. <laughs> OK, uh, well, Emma Booth, as you said, I'm a two-time Australian Paralympian. Uh, my sport is equestrian, dressage. Um, so, yeah, all things horses. Um, I've also been to two world championships and yeah, I just recently had my 10 year anniversary of my accident, which is why I'm in a wheelchair and yeah, open to talk about all things, disability, everything and anything. Love it. Well, that's what this podcast is for. Can I jump in quickly about the accident? Well, mate, you're the host. You can do what you want. I'm oh, well, co-host. Yeah. Um, how many people are surprised when they see Emma Booth, equestrian horses, how many people are surprised that it wasn't a horse-related accident? Um, yeah, that's actually a good, a good question. Oh. There, are, there are definitely a lot of people that would assume because also prior to my accident, I was an eventer, which is um, sort of a bit more of a crazy equestrian sport, a little bit more dangerous. Uh, so eventing, there's three disciplines, dressage, show jumping and cross country. And cross country is basically where they gallop around the paddocks, jumping over big, uh, solid obstacles into water. It's timed, like it's mental. I love um, that during the Olympics, Paralympics. It's so cool. It's, yeah. yeah. Adrenaline. It was yeah. my sort of, that was my favorite part of the sport. Um, so yeah, a lot of people would probably assume the accident might have been related to um, horses, but... Yeah, when I say car accident, the most frequent question I get is, "Oh, well, were you driving?" And I'm like, "Oh, what, it's interesting. Sorry, d why? Why does that matter? Mm. Like, what does that change?" Or do people also probably go, "Were you at fault?" Yeah, yeah. well, that's. I feel like that's, that's sort of by asking that's driving implied. But, oh, oh like, cool. were you were you driving? And it's like, mm. oh, well, if I was, does that mean that you know this was my fault yeah, or like yeah. this? How old were you when you had the accident? I uh, had just turned twenty one. Okay. Do you think it's because you? We're young. I think a lot of people, for some reason, associate car accidents with older people. Like I know a mate of mine, Yannick, who plays wheelchair basketball, he was like 11 when he had a car accident, but it's not really, you don't really see younger people having it. Do you think that might've been why people were surprised about the accident? Potentially. Yeah. But I think also as soon as I add in the element of like the, the accident was involving a truck, um, and yeah, it's a whole thing. There was a court case. Like he was probably the one at fault. He well, hey, if you're up for it, let's get into it. What happened? What happened? Um, basically, he we were on our way home from Albury on the Melbourne Highway. He jackknifed coming around a corner. Um, and ultimately, and I can say this because the court case is done and everything now, in my opinion, I think the reason the accident occurred is because he was probably taking the turn too fast with an empty um, tr truck, trailer, whatever you'd call it. Um, and it was actually, he got off because the speed limit was a hundred, but the recommended speed for that corner, I think was 70. Um, uh, that's when you have the speed being the white yellow, yeah. with the red outline yes. and then the yellow one is your suggested like, oh, what, turn yes, spot. Suggested yeah. what you should, should, be should just be seven. It should just be the change. Well, it did. It actually got changed after oh. my accident. So because... Again, it was it was a, a really bad accident and I was really lucky. My friend who was actually driving, we were both really lucky to come out alive. Um, and unfortunately, there was a lady in a van behind us who passed away. Oh, wow. um, so, again, that sort of led to the court case and of course. All, of, all of that well, sort of stuff. So, What happened to your friend? 
Um, I get that question a lot as well. She was okay. She had a lot of damage to her knee and had to have multiple surgeries around her knee. And I think because of the airbag, she also um, had to have plastic surgery around her lip face. Um, but otherwise, fine. And yeah, she's back riding again. And yeah, she. she Does she have a bit of guilt? Uh, I don't think guilt is the right word. No, I, like she lost a lot in the accident as well. So we had been at a competition and it was her car, her float, and she actually had her two horses on the back of the float during the accident. Um, and unfortunately one, they both, um, passed away. Yeah. So one was, um, you injured, know, beyond, yeah. injured and then had to be euthanized on the, on the, at the scene and um yeah but that is one of the things i remember about the accident being in the car waking up and the whole car was just shaking back and forth shaking like mental and i it took me a bit of time to sort of process and obviously you're in shock um but i'm thinking what is happening like why is and it was the fact that one of the horses was actually just scrambling in the float and um yeah the thought of that still just makes me feel sick to my stomach but yeah. Yeah. So she, yeah, I don't know that guilt's the right word. Um, we're still friends. That's and great. yeah, like she wasn't at fault. There wasn't anything she could have done to prevent the accident from happening. It was just a case of wrong place, wrong time. So this is the Emma Booth story. You've had the accident. You're still in the car. Yes. What, can you take us through the moment that you realized that you, and I'm presuming, couldn't feel your legs or were you so, um, were your thoughts at the moment about the horse and that when you realized, like, what, what's happening? Um, uh, a lot of everything. I think the body is an amazing thing. The brain is an amazing tool. And when you go into that amount of shock, um, the pain, yes, like it's painful, but I feel like a lot of people would hear, oh, this is what happened. Like my injuries were so extensive that I, I really nearly died. Um, and it's one of those odd things where it's not as though I sort of all of a sudden went, oh, I can't feel my legs and I don't think I can walk anymore. Um, I actually for a moment weirdly, for, I thought that the car had been crushed so severely that my legs were just stuck. I, because I, I, I tried to move a couple of times, and it was really painful, but I just thought, oh, I'm just stuck yeah. in here. Um, the most painful thing about the whole experience, probably the most painful thing that I've ever experienced was when they actually pulled me from the vehicle onto the stretcher. Um, yeah, I think I nearly passed out from the pain. Like it was just awful. But again, the, the adrenaline, like your body, it's, it's amazing that, it, yeah, w how it deals with that sort of, um, immediate trauma. So, you forgiven the truck driver? Mm, yes, I think I know. I never really. It's funny, like my dad, for example, he has been in the truck industry his whole life. So, I think he had a far greater understanding of why the truck did what it did and how it happened. And had the truck driver been going a little bit slower, how the whole thing maybe wouldn't have occurred. And I feel like both of my parents felt like they needed somebody to blame for what happened. And that was the truck driver for them. Um, for me, I never really had that sort of anger towards him or it just, again, I sort of, I didn't feel like that was a really good use of my energy. It was just, you know, what had happened had happened. Blaming him wasn't going to change anything. Would it have been ideal if he'd been going a little bit slower? Yes, but, you know... It, it is what it is, sort of. That was my attitude through the whole thing. Just this has happened and now we just take it as it come, comes. So you get transferred onto the stretcher, get through the pain, get through hospital or go to hospital. Can you remember the diagnosis or the moment a doctor had told you? Yes. So I was immediately taken to the Royal Melbourne and um, had to have abdominal surgery because I had internal bleeding. So that was the life-saving surgery. Uh, I then went straight from that surgery. And so again, for me, this is all like a blur because I'm obviously under anesthetic and, you know, it's bits that I then also I'm filled in on after the fact. Uh, I then went straight into my spinal surgery. Um, I've got like a 15 centimeter rod in the lower part of my spine. And 
the thing that I remember is when I woke up from both of those surgeries, I had a tube in my throat that was assisting me to breathe, um, which meant that I couldn't actually talk. So I couldn't communicate with my nurse, nurses or doctors in any other way than I tried to write some notes down. They gave me a pen and paper and I, I tried to write a few things down. Um, but I then started to sort of do, and again, this is not correct, but bits of sign language, you know, like gesturing with my hands as to, and one of the things that I did was a walking gesture with my fingers to my nurse to sort of be like walking. And she, that was a moment where she was sort of like, look, we're still really unsure as to the extent of the injuries, but it's really looking like it's probably not a possibility that you are ever going to walk again. And again, I think people think that you hear this and it's like you straight away just take on that information and it's like, that's what's happened. And oh my God, like your mind is blown. But it's, it wasn't like that for me. It was just this really slow process of taking that information on, you know, like, again, you're under a lot of, um, pretty hardcore drugs at the time. So it's all a bit blurry and it just, yeah, it took time to process that information. So I think it's probably in reality, a little bit different to how it might be portrayed in like movies and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, it, it wasn't just that immediate, like, oh, uh, and, and I think I knew before she had even told me, you know, like there's part of my brain that knew how, that this was significant damage. Like there was, you know, yeah. What was the hardest thing to come to terms with? Your new normal of accessibility or was it body image? Like what were the things that you struggled with once you acquired your disability? Um, or all of the above? Could be anything. All of, the, all of the above, but probably just coming to terms with what my new normal was. Um, you know, I, I was a really active person before my accident, still am now, but just in a different way. So I used to love running. That was sort of my thing. That was my outlet other than riding. Um, so figuring out ways to, oh, okay, I'm feeling, you know, this, how, whatever emotions might be coming over, I'm overwhelmed. Normally I'm going to go for a run. I can't do that anymore. So it was just figuring out new ways of coping, um, with what was happening. Um, the body image, I don't think that was a huge thing. I sort of just, I think the staff, like I was in hospital for five, six months, um, and they, in the rehab, they do such an amazing job of slowly sort of integrating you back into the community, you know, like they'll take you on your first outing to the supermarket with staff from the hospital. And so they really just take you step by step and, and slowly integrate you back into what your new normal is. Um, I think initially when, you know, I was first discharged from hospital, I was a little bit paranoid that I felt like people were looking at me, you know, unlike prior to my accident, I'd just be getting around. Whereas I had this short amount of time where I was going, oh, everyone's looking at me, especially kids, which is fine. Kids are kids. Um, whereas now I, I wouldn't even think twice. So again, that was just a bit of an adjustment, which I think was kind of normal, but yeah, now it's just like, yeah, it is what it is. Horse riding is notoriously an expensive hobby or sport. Uh, what is an understatement un of the century, oh. but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've got a two-year-old daughter and I'm just not letting her watch any horse don't, stuff. Don't let her. Don't, no, don't, pony. don't take her. Next. Don't take her anywhere Back to near Bluey. them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I've actually, she wanted to watch that. There's a cartoon of like a Mustang spirit. Spirit. I was like, we are not cute. watching spirit. Yeah, a cute no, movie, but no. Avoid it. Yeah. Um, but for you, what would be an unexpected cost that I might not recognize that comes with disability or your disability? Like, is there something that's more expensive than uh, a cult or something? I don't know. In and terms of my sport? No, just in, in terms of, oh, well, maybe your adjustment to sport um, through chair, being in a chair. A cult is a type of horse. Emma's not joining a cult, just to make sure. Oh, that. yes, I said cult, C-O-L-T. Yes, And cult. I also, as I said it, wrong animal for the sport. I recognise that, but we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, cost in terms of horses, whether you've got a disability or not, is insane. Um, any person in equestrian can understand that. Talk us through it. How much? What do you mean? Yeah, a good horse is quarter mil, half? No, not a, no way. Like, far lap. 
No, 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 no. The, oh, the far lap of equestrian? How much? It's It just depends on what you're looking for. But, yeah, realistically, if I was wanting to go overseas right now and get a horse for Paris, which is a possibility of what I might be looking at now. Okay. Um, anybody wanting to get on board? Yeah, yep. Sponsors, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, look, realistically, you're probably looking at about 300,000 euro. oh, euros. Euros. Yeah. <laughs> I told you. That's yeah. why I'm not watching Spirit. Yeah. yeah. But again, that's for, you know, like an elite level yeah. competition horse that you would be looking to take to a game. But you need to work with that horse to learn how to ride together, yeah? Because if you just buy them and then next minute you can compete on them or do you have to do like a year together to get the horse human mind reading going on? Look, often I think you need to have a bit of time to work on the relationship with the horse. Um, but, for example, if you have a particularly special one, which I did, so after my accident I had a, a couple of horses that sort of got me back into riding. What were the names? The main guy's name was Zidane. Yeah. His competition name was Mogul Vang Zidane. He was Ooh, Danish. Good name. Yeah. Jeez, that's um, wanky. <laughs> Aren't you oh, Dutch? Yeah. I don't know if it's just imagine that. Mogul Zing Zidane. Mogul Vang Zidane. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So, look, I, I it was getting closer to the Rio Games and I was starting to think, shit, I'm not going to have a horse to actually compete on. And there was – a lot of stuff stuff that went on before I actually got to the Rio Games in that I had sort of said about two weeks after my accident, I want to ride again and I want to go to the Paralympics in Rio. I reckon you're all making that up. This is like the fourth Paralympics had an accident. No. I reckon you're all making it up. Like it's just too good a movie. It, yeah. it, it sounds like a bit of a movie, but I genuinely remember I got given an iPad from my dad's boss at the time and obviously it was in bed and had a lot of time to – lay and think and Google. And that's when I started looking into para equestrian, para dressage, Paralympics. And literally my mum and dad came to visit that night and they were like, how's your day? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, good. How's yours? Yeah, good. And then I said to them, oh guys, just so you know, I'm no longer an eventer. I'm now going to be a para dressage rider and I'm going to go to the Paralympics in Rio in 2016. And they were like, oh yeah. Okay. Hmm. Uh, and like, obviously at the time that it was a dream goal, like it was, I wasn't sitting, sitting there thinking that that might be a reality right then and there, but I put it out there and then my friends and family got on board, um, an amazing family friend of mine who's sort of like a pseudo uncle. He decided that he was going to ride his bike around Australia to raise the funds for me in order to be able to purchase my first horse to get me to the games. Um, and the support that he received was just mind blowing. And still to this day, I don't think it's completely sunk in as to how incredible what he did and the people that got behind him, like how, how amazing it was. Um, but because of that, I also felt like there was this pressure that there'd been so much support. If I didn't get to the games in Rio, like I'd be disappointing all these people. Um, and luckily going back to the horse situation, it was three weeks before the second last qualifying event for Rio that mm, my coach said, come and have a sit on this horse. He's just around the corner. And mind you, I'd been overseas twice to look for horses and came back empty handed. Mm. So she's like, oh, 10 minutes away, there's this horse. And I was like, oh yeah, whatever. Like I've sat on this many, I'll go have a look. I went to Europe looking for yeah, a horse. You twice. think I'm going to find one? Twice. Yeah. 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 And anyway, I went and had a sit and he was just amazing, picked up everything up straight away. And the only factor that then at the time was, do we have enough time to actually pull this together to qualify? Like three weeks as a combination, not a lot, not a long time. And he was just the most phenomenal horse that just got me. He tried so hard and we went to that qualifying event. Um, we got the highest scores of all para dressage riders competing at the time. And we also broke the um, Australian record at the time for the highest um, freestyle score, both para and able body dressage. Pretty good. No, I yeah, just not got bad. a little goosebump. That's nice. <laughs> Three again, weeks. And I never, I never tell that story to be like, oh, I'm so amazing. It's more about this horse. Well, your connection with the horse. But yeah. for him to be able to do that for me, for a para rider, like it was just, it was yeah, beyond phenomenal. And anyway, he was the horse that then took me to Rio. We went to the world championships in 2018 in America. He also then got to Tokyo, um, which with the postponement was a big challenge because he was 
getting older at the time. So adding another year to that campaign and actually having to completely requalify again. I feel your pains and I struggled as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Dylan serious. was like, <laughs> that extra year, yeah, I was like, Tokyo. no. And there was all these really good young Dutch kids. I was like, oh, I would have smashed them last year. <laughs> but now they're really good. 12 months. I got there, though. It, it makes a difference, though. 12 there. months. Yeah, oh, it's huge. I was washed by the end of it. Yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, yeah, he got there and um, did super. And then, yeah, unfortunately, he passed away unexpectedly um, at the start of last year when, like, after Tokyo when we got home. So, um, Gave yeah. Gave you everything. Was, what yeah. A, what a great horse. Yeah, he was So we super. are on the hunt, though. We are on the hunt, yeah. I've got a couple at home, well, that are coming this week and see what happens. But, um, yeah, we might go over to Europe and see if there's anything over there. Cool. I do love that he was just around the corner, though. I yeah. did. I read. Oh, so annoying. It happens, like, it happens a lot, though. And mum and dad are always like, oh, I was just meant to be, oh, meant gosh. to be. I'm like, oh. So when Angus found me, just to, you know. He was just around just the around corner. corner. Propel Angus's career. <laughs> just around, I was just around the corner. A topical example of this I read the other day was uh, a, the AFL was looking for a new CEO. Uh, so Gil McLaughlin had retired. And they paid, the AFL paid a recruiting company over a million dollars to find the next CEO. Who did they hire? The guy who was three offices down from Gil. I'm like, after, after all that all extensive that, search, yeah. just, g'day Gil, can I take the office now? Could have done so that it, but it is, happens a lot, you know? Yeah. And, um, and Zidane? Zidane. Zidane. RIP, what a great horse. But what I want to know about the horses, sorry, I need to know before, while we're still on it. What is the differences between... Um, para dressage uh, and, and equestrian riding um, versus like what, what are the, with the horse, what's that connection different with? Because you can't kick the heels of the horse or something like that. You yeah. Know? So I think for particularly um, para dressage in great lower grades. So mine, my grade and grades one and two. Lower grade meaning high level disability. Yes. Yep. More, Look yep, at me. more severely dis disability. Look at me, I'm all over it. Yep. Well, I was Go watching on. in the village, watching you. So yeah. Now I know. yeah. Yeah. So so I think they, as the horses, have to have a little bit more of an understanding. Um, for example, you know, I, can't, I don't have the use of my low, lower leg and that's in everybody dressage how you tell the horse to go forward, how you tell them to move to the side, how you get, now I'm getting technical, but bend, flexion, all that sort of stuff. Dance, like not dance. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's pressure as well of the leg that's against what, the horse. That's, yes. Yeah, to really connect the horse, the leg is what connects them into the contact. So how do you do it without legs? So how you do it without legs is one, having a horse that's really willing to work with you, that's really willing to try. But for me, um, I have to train them sort of more to voice commands. So oh, wow. Do you whisper in? Well, not really. You do. <laughs> no, I do Go weird. Left. I do weird noises like little and clicks, and uh. like he'll know the difference between my one click, which now I don't have water in my mouth. Go so have a go. The one click, that's just to go a little bit more forward within the rhythm or within the pace. But then if I do a few short, short, short sharper clicks, that's to go up a up a gear. So uh. from walk to trot. How do you, you know they do you you and the horse do like one leg and different legs at the time. How do you communicate that? Like left or right? Yeah, so that's Not just again, walking, but like actual, I don't, I don't say dancing, but. Prancing. 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 prancing uh, or like yeah, the double leg. leg. Or as Snoop Dogg called it, crip walking. Yeah, yeah crip walking. <laughs> um, to be honest, and I get this question a lot, I do, I have two, I ride with two whips that are sort of a compensating aid for my leg. So in the need um, where you'd normally put your leg on, I might just do a light little touch with oh, the whip. Yeah. Or you could use your arms, couldn't you too? Sorry? Sorry, could you use your arms as well? Or are you holding on? To no, the arms are there for the the, the reins. Up, shut yeah, up, yeah, shut up, shut up. Keep that to yourself. Yeah, um, like, <laughs> at that moment, it was like like you were gonna go. Oh, I could be why using my arms. Why have I thought of that before? Man, why could... am I clicking with uh, my mouth? Like, I use my, <laughs> my arms. And Dylan was going to be like, Gah. I used no. to my ponies riding for the disabled. You did. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, right. yeah. You know, riding for the disabled? Yeah, yeah. It's actually awesome. They yeah. do a great ride right across oh, the country. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah. I was just actually down at the um, Pakenham RDA. They've just opened up a new arena there um, through, yeah, VRC sponsored their new arena. So that was amazing. There you go. Um, but yeah, no, the communicating, it's it's education, teaching the horse what you want to do. But sometimes people would ask, oh, well, how do you do, you know, a leg yield or this with Zidane? And I'd sometimes be like, honestly, I feel like, and this is where you guys are going to roll your eyes and be like, this bitch is crazy. <laughs> um, 
I would just think something like I would just be going right well now I want to and this isn't in my test but now I want to canter or now I want to change um do a flying change and just almost think it my body might just change slightly in the saddle and he would be like yeah I got this like it's it sounds really Confirmed. corny Suss on that. yeah is it, no that, but it is that you've got to have show? this the wild thornberries where she can jump animals that's what I think about oh. <laughs> Okay, very 90s, yeah, 2000s a reference. reference. No, I think I got, this is not the same example, but why I agree with, I can understand the connection of mind with something that isn't your body. Oh, here he is, the dog whisperer, watch this. Well, no, if I, hey, when's is. the new thing about lunch? My golden retriever's like, oh, fuck you, dad. <laughs> <laughs> Always, I'm right. Yeah. No, I am I remember watching well, I snowboarding is like subtle, like it's like you move your eyes yes. and your body and like the See? snowboard goes. That was my only reference. Like it's not, I thought when you turn on a snowboard, you go, Whoa! but it's not, it's all about slight movements of your neck or your See, eyes. Yeah, you know, I think you're taught, well, as a rider from a young age, like, you know, your eyes, you're always looking where you're wanting to go. You're looking where, yeah. And it's the slightest, the thing with dressage, it's so intricate. So you know, you say something about, oh, well, can't you use your hands? The hands are there to communicate with the bit, which is in the horse's mouth. That's what keeps the contact and that's what judges are looking for, the horse to be really steady and, and still in the contact. Um, but, yeah, the slightest shift or uh, change in your weight is what communicates with the horse. And I think another funny thing about equestrian, and now we're just making this whole like horse podcast, so I apologize. No, 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 because it's um, our equestrian. Well, it's interesting. And dressage, sorry. We can talk tennis if you want. But you often Please get don't. The, you often get the people going, oh, but well, you just sit there and do nothing, especially in oh, able dressage. Like, oh, you don't do anything. The horse does all the work. And you're like, actually, thank you. That's a compliment because if it looks like, the less it looks like you're doing, the better job you're doing. Same as car drivers. Like, oh, it's just because you've got a good car. It's like, well, no, they're driving the car. Um, how do you how do you not fall off the horse because you can't use your legs and do you have abs? Yes, I do. So yeah. I'm, so I'm uh, ab freeze. It's ninety three, ninety. I like um, that. <laughs> and I would just stack it on the side. So like, tell me, are you strapped in? Like, I would be strapped into my wheelchair. What's the deal? And slowly just bring in the fact that everyone has abs, but you're talking about the le or the level, level of, of where your injury was. So yeah. Dylan's is higher than yours. So you have abs. Able-bodied guy, just explain it to the people. I don't actually have, they probably, they're, they're not really in there. I don't have any abs. Oh, come on. You know what I, mean? I saw you take a photo of yourself in the sauna shirtless last night. You think you've got abs. Yeah, but I went, I went, I went up abs. I went just chest and shoulders. <laughs> Okay, sure, focus, good parts. focus on the pros. Yeah. But so, yeah, your your level of injury is low, so you have control of your abs, which is super important. But still, you, you, would, need to, you would need to be strapped in, yes? Yeah, yeah. So my legs are strapped to the stirrups. The stirrups are strapped to the girth so my legs don't flap around. Um, and then I've got Velcro straps over my thighs to sort of hold me in. And I'm, I have a bar at the front of the saddle, which I can sort of hold on to if I need that support. Ever fell off? once what happened? Oh, it's and good. now i have to touch wood oh, because yes. you're gonna have Thanks, Dylan. yeah no only once um and that wasn't on zadar this was on another horse name and shape no i don't yeah no i would <laughs> he was an asshole um <laughs> and he, yeah he spooked so like they jumped to the side and i sort of lost my balance got thrown to the side and then because i was on the side not where I was supposed to be, he then started spooking at me being on the side and like running away from me. And so anyway, I then, yeah, ended up in the sand and felt humiliated. Speaking of spooking, I have a tough, I, t I struggle with horse riding and equestrian morally around treatment of horses. Ooh, okay. Interesting. <laughs> like I used to go to the horse racing and I don't really go anymore. I stopped going to the Melbourne Cup after Melbourne I watched Cup. Yeah, I four years ago, just before COVID, one of the horse fell out and right in front of us. I was like, ah. uh, yeah. Speaking of, you know, spooking and them having injuries, dispel my moral dilemma around yeah. the mistreatment of horses for sport or entertainment. Right. So I would have to say that people who are not within the equestrian community probably – don't understand the level of care and um, treatment that they, these horses receive. So uh, don't get me wrong, I, there is obviously like an element of um, certain people that probably are mistreating horses, animals. That's just, you know, like some people do the wrong thing. But in terms of like race horses and dressage horses, high performance horses, you have to have those horses in the best 
physical health, the best mental health, like they are looked after better than I look after myself as an, a, an athlete. Um, and I, I think that people probably don't realize just how well cared for these horses are. Like they're receiving physio, you know, once a fortnight, they're receiving all these, just everything that you can do for these horses, they're looked after just immaculately. Yes, accidents sometimes happen and that's a real shame. Um, but I think that what what else, like if they weren't within these disciplines of what you're doing, they're not going to be cared for in the same no, way. No, for sure. It's, so, it's, like it's just an interesting conversation to have. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And particularly, you know, like there are a few things probably more so within the racing industry in terms of accidents. And, you know, the other thing that I think people every day don't realize for Australia, the, you know, the biggest race is the Melbourne cup for sure. Racing happens every day of the year in, in, in racing, country racing, wherever it might be. And the number of like, it just sometimes is really unfortunate that it seems the Melbourne cup is the day if something's going to ha- go wrong. But it's because it's too many horses on the track potentially. Yeah, it, it is. But again, people don't understand the level of like vetting and, you know, the, the scanning, the the horses are gone over with a fine tooth comb before they are allowed to race. They're done a week before, the morning before, an hour before, like each horse is physically looked at to make sure that they're fit and healthy to run the race. Um, and then sometimes, yeah, it's just accidents happen. Do you get much hate? Online, do you get any hate from fans or? Well, do, you, do you find a difference between um, para dressage and, you know, competitive horse racing? Yes, but uh, I'm a little bit involved in both. Um, so I'm a para dressage rider, but I'm also an ambassador for Victoria Racing Club. And in terms of getting hate, social media, like you, you're always going to get people that have something to say that, you know, is putting you down is disagreeing with you. Like I've gotten to a point where sometimes I'll be posting things on social media and just don't read the comments anymore because you just never know what you're going to get. Again, another one that I receive is like, if you look at any um, images or videos of me riding, when I ride, I lean quite far back. That's just where my center of gravity is. That's where my best balance is. And physically, I think because I don't have complete control of my legs to hold on, I can't physically hold myself in a, a straight frame like an able-bodied dressage rider would. So that's the first thing people comment on, you know. Oh, you're no good. Why, why back, are you leaning yeah. so far back? This is, you know, putting pressure on the horse. Like people just, and you're like. Yeah. Right. I'm chair expert. Yeah. I've got a question for this. This is my bowl of uncomfortable, but this is, a, I think, a, a it's, it's a two-part question. Uh, there's an obvious one, which I don't, I'm just going to, I'm setting up the second part of the question. But if you could click your fingers and go back to Aubrey or wherever you were before your accident, um, would you change things if you knew that that was going to happen? Um, knowing where you are today, being the Amber Booth, you know, multiple Paralympic champ. Um, it's that is a, probably a question I get a fair bit as well. I've got. A, I'm saying I'm leading up okay, to my good. second question. I want a second, say boring. I want a second question. <laughs> yeah. I know, I want a second question. Um, because the answer would be no, you know, and I've had this conversation with a lot of people. I've had this conversation with, again, I keep referring to my parents, but obviously this was a big thing for them to adjust to as well. And I've had that conversation going, I don't think that I would go back and change what happened. The people that I've met, what I've achieved, the places I've traveled, you know, I've made the most of my situation and, and I wouldn't change anything about it. Um, if you ask my parents that, they'd probably have a different answer. That's my second part. Oh, what do you I've think your mind. parents would do if they had the option for you? There you go. Because I'm, I'm a parent already, and I'm yeah, like. Yeah, so I've had, again, I've had that conversation with them a number of times and mum probably more so. Yeah, I think, and she's openly said to me, I love everything you've achieved, you know, but as a parent, it was such a difficult thing to go through or to see me going through, to adjust to um, some of the challenges that I've had to overcome. If she could take that away from me, you know, she really struggles with that answer. Like, I think she'd probably say, yes, she doesn't outright because I don't think she wants to be like, uh, you know, I, I wish you weren't disabled. 
Like, that's not her, her point of view at all, but it's just that... No parent wants to watch their kid in pain yeah, at any stage. You know, well, you know? and, and I think more, the point is more for them that they nearly lost their daughter. You know, like, I, I very nearly wasn't here today. Um, and so I think that's probably more for them that if we could have changed what happened, would we? Probably. Whereas I, you know, yeah, I, I, I it was a struggle the first few weeks were the hardest um but i i wouldn't i wouldn't change it what was their reaction to when you put on the green and gold slash blue mm. blazer and represented australia at oh Pearl they Books? were proud as punch you know i reckon they were pretty happy with you at were, that point they were over the moon they were all in rio they all came to rio to watch um wouldn't have been able to go to tokyo because of covid restrictions no, you know but, that we went by ourselves it sucked that was the only bad part about tokyo yeah. Although in saying that, I was really lucky because of my grade and I don't know whether this is a thing with Equestrian Australia or Paralympics Australia, but I was able to have a carer. So mum got to come to Tokyo with me I as was my carer. Say, there's got to be people with disability who need the support and that support person might be their What parent. the hell? You're less disabled than I am. I didn't get a carer. Oh, wow. Oh, um, here we go. Sucks to be you. What the <laughs> hell is that? Here's a competition. He wants a gold medal of who's... <laughs> I'm more disabled than you. I, I should have played it up. Yeah, why didn't you? You should what have just asked. That? They I probably would have given you one. Oh, That's God. ridiculous. Actually, my mum's great. She would have been your carer if you wanted her I don't know your mum. She's legit. Yeah. 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 The, we finish all of our podcasts with a bowl of uncomfortable. This Good. is a question where uh, I think this one's not too bad. Um, this is where people send us questions knowing you're going to be on the podcast. Maybe it's a question they would feel comfortable saying to your face but won't get the opportunity to. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes or a lot of the time it's something that people are curious about but probably wouldn't have the confidence to ask you in person. Here we go. Um, this one is, do you think you would have been a professional rider or has your fame and success been because of your disability and competing against a very different skill and size pool? I get that a fair bit as well, um, particularly when I go to pr like primary schools and at the end the kids get to ask a question and they're like, "Would well, did you want to go to the Olympics before you had your accident? <sighs> to be honest, my very, very honest answer, I do not think that I would have got to the same level of competition that I have achieved as a para rider. That's because Andrew Hoy's been about 27 games. Yeah, exactly. You can't. Equestrian knowledge. Yeah, look Count at you name dropping over there. Yeah, no, he's been about a zillion. And to, equestrian is that sort of niche sport where 50% of the partnership is made up of the horse. So without the horse and the quality of horse, it's difficult to get to that elite level. Because of my circumstances, I was actually able to get that horsepower behind me and therefore achieve what I was able to achieve. That's not to say I didn't want to go to the Olympics before my accident. I just think in reality, would it have happened? I don't think so. <laughs> But we will never know. Yeah. And you did. You made it to the Paralympics. Yeah, exactly. Um, so quickly before we leave, Paris is an option. You're currently looking around. Like, I, what was the name of the person? I know that guy, the grey-haired guy who's, like, got short hair. He's been in, like, yeah. Andrew, he's bald. Yeah, I was going to say Andrew. Bald as. Like, he's okay. bald. He's, a, he's been literally in nine games. Yeah, I was going to say, I thought it was Eight, yeah. I think, but, yeah. <laughs> he he was my idol, like, when I was a kid. All I remember right. having the posters on my is wall. Is he done now? Andrew. Surely. No. No way. No, is he yeah. going for Paris? He's going for Paris. Nine. <laughs> yeah. And he, he, what blows my mind is he's in eventing. Like he's not a dressage rider. Sometimes dressage riders, I think, are able to go a little bit. Yeah. Let, yeah. It's yeah. just less. Um, Toll on the body. Yeah. He's an eventer. Yeah. How he still, like, he's, he's amazing. Horse hunting at the moment. Yes. Let's have we find well, the looking, next sedan. Looking for a horse I would yeah. go with. Not horse, horse hunting. hunting. Yeah, okay. Looking, after, after the looking for a shooting, partner. That's probably a, a good, good <laughs> Looking for a partnership looking with for a horse. Yeah, click. Good one. Horse shopping. Um, we find the right horse. We're in Paris. And do you see um, beyond that what... What, what do you want Emma Booth to be known as? Because, like, we have, like, you might have seen Abigail Vidler. She, we had her on the podcast um, a couple of years ago now. You're her idol. But then for somebody else who maybe doesn't want to know Emma Booth as a, a para dressage rider, what do you want to be known as? What, what, what is it beyond horse riding? Well, what do you want to do? Be, yeah. Tough one. Um, so, to, again, like my completely raw, honest answer, I feel like in the last 10 years I've really focused – on my riding career, that's sort of been my, um, yeah, focus. My main thing is my riding, getting to the next games, getting to the next championship, um, pushing myself to do better in, in my sport. 
And I think it's probably taken me 10 years of living with a disability to really now be at a point of going, I need to be doing more than that. I want to be giving back. Um, I'm looking at potentially working with um, Spire, so at the Royal Talbot, um, which is where I went through rehab, um, basically doing some peer peer support work there with um, people that have newly acquired spinal cord injuries, um, integrating them back into the community, their their new life, all that sort of stuff, um, advocating for people with disabilities in, in that sense. And yeah, I think that's, but, but at the same time, I still am super passionate about my sport. So I want to go to Paris. Again, the other benefit of equestrian is that I've got a few more years physically left in me to go to a few more games. Um, you know, Zidane was an amazing horse and we've achieved a lot, but I'm still yet to come back from a games with a medal. That's something that I want to do, that I want to achieve. Um, so again, in looking for a horse for Paris, it's really like I know what the level of competition is now. I know what the level the horse has to be at. That's what I want. That's what I want to do, go out there and hopefully come back with a, with a medal. Going to be live on nine as well, same as the Olympics. Yeah, which saw is that. Announced, which yeah. Is, just saw that. This is going to be a great. Tough time zone, but like for Australia, but yes. the broadcast oh, yeah. will be incredible. Yeah. So. Really hope you, I mean, you're going to go there. Who are we kidding? But it'd be awesome to see you get over there and, and have a crack. And you're bloody well spoken. Yeah. Emma, you're good. bloody killing it. Yeah. Well done. Oh, thanks. Is Brisbane getting the Olympics or the Commonwealth Games? Olympics. Okay. Olympics. Yeah, Olympics. 2032. 2032. 2032. You'll, be pretty, you'll be pretty washed by then. Ah, 42. 2032? Uh, yeah, I'll be there. There you go. How old are you now? 31. 31. Yeah, I'm 32. I might make a comeback. Do it. <laughs> no way. <laughs> No, yeah, we'll get, give me a horse. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll get you into para dressage. I'll teach you. I'm trying to think of my pony's name for riding the disabled. Zach and I used to ride the same pony. Anyway, it's not my Oh, the one at the Victoria one, yeah. No, I used to be in St. Kilda Beach. We used to do riding. Yeah, I know. You've talked about him before with Abigail. You said he was really grumpy. Grumpy. Oh, what was his name? Anyway, right. not, not anyway, for me. Questions? Your... Or, that's your bag, not mine. Okay. Yeah. Even though he's definitely trying to make it his. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I tried tennis when I was at the table, but actually so bad. Yeah. Mm. And you know what? What's one, of, one of the hardest sports. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. If he uh, says so himself. Yeah, that's right. Um, Emma Boo, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, welcome back anytime. Maybe after. Plug the socials. What are you? Yeah. Uh, Emma Booth underscore para equestrian. Perfect. Very and that nice. is, if that is a hard word for you to spell, we make it very easy. It's underneath us in the show notes, one click away. Also, we'll link everything else that we can find about you in there okay. so people can get more. Emma in their life. Awesome. Uh, good luck with Paris. We'll thank be cheering you, you on. Um, and thank you once again for coming on the Listen Able no podcast. No worries. Thank you very much for having me. It's been great.